education <laughs> here at Berkeley. Um, Professor Shaken is highly regarded, um, a, a highly regarded expert in, in terms of labor issues in both the United States and Mexico. And he was a leading advisor to the Democratic leadership against the NAFTA legislation in 1994. Since the passage of that agreement, um, he has served as an advisor on globalization to key leaders of the United States Congress. He's a policy make to policymakers and unions throughout the United States. Um, he also took the entire elected leadership of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace um, to the border to show them the impacts on NAFTA, an enormous event, and I think very impactful when I spoke to Professor Shaken um, that trip. Um, I, I, I have to say, um, I immediately thought of Professor Shaken when, uh, when, when I wanted to, uh, when we were putting together this event. I can't imagine, I can't think of no one who would, who's better equipped to talk about um, NAFTA, where we are now, here in the United States and in Mexico. So it's an extraordinary honor to have both of these professors here tonight. Please give them a very warm welcome. First, I'd say, it, I would agree with you, this is a very powerful film. And were it a film about this river, we should be outraged. Uh, but it's not simply the Santiago River. There are many rivers that I've personally visited uh, that are comparable to this. And the human cost uh, is extraordinary. This is 20 years after the implementation of an agreement that was supposed to address it. I'd have to say, I don't think I think of it in terms of the worst bad guys. I think we're looking at a perfect storm of bad guys where even firms that want to do the right thing wind up with fierce pressures and real inducements to do the wrong thing. Somebody is pouring these chemicals into that river uh, and there isn't the checks, balances, and regulation in any effective way that's going to stop it. This predated NAFTA. The notion was that NAFTA would address it. And I think what is so profoundly visible here is in the Santiago River, it didn't. But I would say, far more broadly, what we're looking at is a failure of the agreement in one of the core things it was supposed to do protect the environment. Well, let's pause there for a moment. Um, I'm going to play, a, I'm going to channel a voice that I suspect is not likely to get much channeled in this particular audience, which is that of the NAFTA supporters, both yes. then and now. And there still are some now. Um, so back 
1993 and 92, when NAFTA was being discussed, I think it's fair to say that environmental protection was not its primary goal. Its right. primary goal was, of course, creating something that they referred to as an integrated North America for trade purposes. Environmental protection wasn't even included mm -hmm. in the bill that finally passed in 1994. And then President Clinton came along and said, we're going to do side agreements on environmental protection. <coughs> what happened? Well, this was an initially posed as a debate between free trade and protectionism. Right. Uh, that had little to do with what the reality was in 1993. That's a 19th century debate. It's historically interesting. All trade today is highly managed. If you wanted a free trade agreement between the United States and Mexico, you could do that on the back of a postcard. Uh, we agreed to eliminate all tariffs and both countries sign it, we're done. NAFTA is 1,200 pages long. What's the other 1,199 and a half pages? What it is, is it's a highly managed trade agreement. And the notion was you were bringing three countries together in North America, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And the, and the key, what NAFTA was about, was to harmonize upwards the regulations and the issues facing the business community. So when it comes to intellectual property rights, very strong detailed language, method of redress. When it comes to protecting investment, the same thing. And you can go on in all these areas, and many of these areas are in fact important if you want to see trade increase. But when it comes to labor issues or the environment, it was completely left out of the initial agreement that was signed by President George H.W. Bush and the other two uh, leaders. Uh, but under Bill Clinton, nine months was, was spent negotiating side agreements. The problem with the side agreements were the real leverage is before you sign anything. Once you've signed the agreement and ratified it with or without the side agreements, Essentially, you've ratified the status quo because the other countries, particularly in this case Mexico, have no incentive for any of the changes that were being called for. And that's in fact precisely what happened. So you wound up with a very rapid increase in the value of trade between the three countries, particularly between the US and Mexico, without any attention to the environment or labor issues. You're absolutely right. It was never sold as an environmental agreement, but in the first nine months of the Clinton administration, that became a real issue of the environment and labor to get it ratified. So all kinds of promises were made in that regard that simply didn't take place. So in that sense, for me, it was best summarized by a person who headed the Environmental Secretariat, which was set up under NAFTA. This is a secretariat located in Dallas that deals with environmental issues in all three countries where someone, where an NGO or a firm or some entity feels that the environmental provisions such as they are were being violated. So the, I spoke with the director of this, who had been director for five years. He was Mexican, and I think a very decent, uh, very capable person on the environment. So I asked him, actually right here on this campus, the Center for Latin American Studies brought him. I said, after five years, how would you rate what the environmental side agreement has done? And I, I expected all kinds of things, but I was actually shock. He looked at me and he said, well, it was designed to fail and it succeeded. <laughs> so if I were, again, a gung-ho free trade NAFTA supporter circa 1994 or 5, I would say to you, this was a very powerful film about the Mexican government screwing up. Mm -hmm. These are companies that brought 52,000 jobs to this community. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for that relatively nice looking home that the family fled. We saw the nice furniture, we saw that it was not uh, a campesino home in Mexico. 
Um, and it's not our problem, it's not <coughs> us free trade supporters who are to blame for the fact that Mexico's own enforcement bureaucracy is so inept and corrupt that it doesn't clean up its own rivers. We brought what we said we would bring, which is jobs and an increased middle class to Mexico. Now answer, answer me, as I think you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, that argument is certainly made. And, and let me reemphasize, the issue isn't trade. I think trade, it can be very positive. I think trade and expanded trade could benefit Mexico, benefit the US, and benefit Canada. That's not the issue. The issue is the rules of the game and who benefits in each of the countries. And we have a fundamental choice. Do we want high productivity prosperity, which people share in, or do we want what one might call high productivity poverty and high productivity and very disastrous environmental conditions? They're not inevitable, but it goes beyond the fa failures of the Mexican government here. Uh, absolutely. Jobs were brought to Mexico, but it's a squandered opportunity because the gains of trade are not broadly shared and you pay a price that's unconscionable. But this isn't a story of Salto near Guadalajara. It's not even a story about Mexico. If you have these kinds of situations in Mexico, the way that shows up in a balance sheet is cost. If you dump these hazardous chemicals into the river, it's a lot cheaper than the processing required to ensure that you're not polluting. You've set the standard for cost throughout North America. In fact, you've set a global standard. So you're challenging US firms to stay here or to move to a place where this is going to be winked at uh, and not effectively enforced. Can you have competitive, profitable companies and enforce environmental and labor regulations? I believe you absolutely can. But if you don't address it in a way that's, that's as effective as the investment and in intellectual property <coughs> issues were addressed, then you are setting a race to the bottom that will be damaging in Stockton, California, uh, not just in Salto near Guadalajara. One of the principal arguments that you read nowadays um, by, as, as you probably know, when you look through the general press, uh, especially the mainstream economic press, uh, there's a sort of consensus that 20 years after was like, it's not as bad as Ross Perot. Some of you don't remember Ross Perot because you're too young. But Ross Perot ran for president when some of you guys were in nursery school and said that NAFTA that his most famous line of his campaign was that NAFTA would bring about the great sucking sound of American jobs being lost to Mexico. So the consensus that you read now, again, in the sort of right here, Forbes-ish mainstream press is not as bad as Perot said it would be, not as good as the NAFTA booster said it would be, neither disaster nor big success. You'll, I'm sure, have some issues with that particular assessment, sure. but I want to ask you the other thing that they all say, which is far less important to these broad questions than NAFTA is China, is what happened with Asia, which was really not foreseen by many people as the big question in 1994. So the first broad question I want to ask you about NAFTA is, if we look at the problems of these people in an industrial area and focus on NAFTA and what happened in the US, are we missing the most enormous picture, which is China and Asia and its effect on US trade? Uh, I think you're making an excellent point uh, about China. In the NAFTA debate, China didn't exist. In fact, the rest of the world didn't exist. It was the United States and Mexico. Canada virtually didn't exist. In, in the debate at the time. That was a mistake, but that create, that reflected the passion of the moment. Uh, but why, China, and China has emerged as a huge factor since then, as we well know. But the issue here is, on what basis should we have rules of the game for global trade? What happens between the US and Mexico isn't simply a bilateral relationship. It is setting a pattern that the US has the economic power to at least put out there much more broadly on a global scale. If you accept this in Salto, what in the world do you say vis-a-vis -vis Foxconn in China? 
or you are always addressing the disaster that's happened, the thousand people that burned to death in a garment, or, or that are crushed in a garment factory in Bangladesh. So the issue really is having the standard and showing that you can be very competitive under that standard, but that's the rules of the game. When, you, when it comes to that business person, let's say, or the mythical NAFTA supporter who says, look, it is done so well in terms of jobs for Mexico, in terms of uh, the economy, both of which I think are arguable, but if you ask that person, if you said, well, that's great, do we really need all this pesky language concerning intellectual property rights. I was in Mexico and you could buy Microsoft Word for $5 a copy or Microsoft Office for $5 a copy. What's wrong with that? As Mexico improves, as the economy gains, then naturally uh, people and companies will begin respecting intellectual property rights. But until then, not to worry. Look at the gains. I don't think anyone would accept that. Right. But that's precisely what we're saying when it comes to labor rights and when it comes to the environment. And no one then or now is talking about US standards, in some cases because they're not that good. They're talking about principles and enforceable principles that benefit the country involved and that benefit how trade is conducted globally. The issue here is I think it's in all anyone in the US interest to see a growing, prosperous, successful Mexican economy, uh, but not an economy that has gains narrowly shared at the expense of most Mexicans and that damage, uh, that damages the lives of ordinary people in the US, Canada, and the rest of the world. One last question before I open it up to everybody. Um, you're the emperor of the world. You can wave your wand and fix this. What do you do? There are a lot of options that really aren't there. It truly is when you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube, it's difficult to get it to go back in. Uh, repeal of NAFTA won't be in the cards anytime soon. Uh, but I think it's- And repeal of NAFTA doesn't- Doesn't do this, doesn't this solve it, all. no. It's not gonna shut down these factories. You want language that is going to spur trade but in the right way that people share from it. So I think there are two basic things that are worth looking at. First, to learn from the experience. So something that's under discussion right now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a NAFTA writ large for 11 countries, really not go forward absent addressing language that would prevent the Santiago River writ large. That's critical. We don't just say, this is bad, let's move on. We say, until we fix this. And, and, and where is the Trans-Pacific Partnership now in terms of discussion? Is this the next, there was a, a bill called the Trade Act yes. that was a version of this that died in Congress in 2009. Yes. Um, what is the Trans-Pacific Partnership along these lines? An idea or is it actual, um, written language yet that could be applied uh, The somewhere. written language is almost complete. It has been done in a very, very secretive way. I don't even think the NSA knows what's in the agreement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I think the politics of this are very, very tricky. I don't think the Democrats, certainly not the President, wants to push forward aggressively before November, and many Republicans don't want to. Trade, and I hesitate to say free trade, it's really unregulated trade for labor and the environment, going forward uh, is not popular among most Americans. And the reason is their experience with it on a day-to-day -day basis has often been negative with people in factories who have been threatened with the closure of a plant if this or that uh, doesn't happen. And with people far from globally traded goods feeling some of the pressures that come out of this. So I don't think anything's going to happen soon and I think we'll see a very significant drive <coughs> post-November, almost whichever way the election So you carried. mentioned two places you would yes. start. One is the Trans-Pacific Partnership or something like it. Yes. What is the second? Uh, the second is there is something we can do in North America. And this may sound ironic. It is 
deepen the integration. That is to pull together with the US and Mexico in particular because that's where the disparity of the economies is greatest and to seek ways of more productively bringing the economy together, for example, akin to what the European Union did with uh, Spain and Portugal. Didn't work out so well. Uh, not as a European Union, but this part actually did work out. That is the, the uh, investment in the economically less developed parts of that that resulted in a broadly based development. But to make the price of admission to that, uh, redoing the labor and environmental provisions, meaning that this is not separate. Uh, but I think that could work in a way that benefits Mexicans. It could work in a way that benefits people in the United States and certainly in Canada. So I think one doesn't simply say, well, you can't reopen the agreement. We throw up our hands and move on. We look at ways in which you can address this dimension of it, which is so horrific in a meaningful way that does benefit Mexicans as well as the others in North America. Um, with that, let's take some questions. Yes, sir. Well, we just gave it a And please, please speak up so people in the back can yes. hear you because you're not mic. To begin with, I think you're a little sanguine to say that uh, yeah, the development of industry that you have in had to environment. The free trade agreement is the imposition worldwide of the capitalist system. Uh, it's a contradiction in terms. Capital the earth and capitalism are contradiction in terms. I have one question. Uh, what functions does the CEC play? What is the CEC, please? I am very bad. Uh, Steve, do you mind me? What is the, um, it's a uh, organization uh, between the consists of uh, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. It's based in Montreal, and its issues are the effects on the environment of NAFTA. And they will be having the convention, I think, this summer in Oaxaca. Uh, I'm sorry, I misstated something earlier that you just pointed out. The environmental secretariat I was talking about is, in fact, based in Montreal. It is the CEC. The equivalent labor secretariat is based in Dallas and is meant to do the same thing for labor issues. Both cover the side agreements. To my knowledge, the CEC does not do much. They do reports. Some of them are of some value. But there is no meaningful enforcement mechanism in the CEC or no major incentive for anyone to comply with issues that are brought before it. The common agreement during the NAFTA debate uh, was that the language of the CEC was better than the language in the labor side agreement. So however weak the CEC is, and it is, I think, genuinely very weak, that's why I think most people would have a hard time even identifying it at this point. Uh, it, the labor side agreement, I could not point to something that has really been addressed under it. During the NAFTA debate and after NAFTA was passed, it was passed in the US House by a vote of 234 to 200, uh, the notion was that just illuminating the problems would embarrass firms on labor and environmental issues to do something. That has proved completely meaningless. So short answer, not much. Next question, please. Um, I've got one for the filmmakers. Um, for start, where, oh, there you go. <coughs> Who are the worst violators? Were you able to find that out? What companies? It's, it's difficult to say. One of the, one of the worst, and this is based on public records that we've, um, we have um, as a result of the investigation that is ongoing, is Huntsman. Um, it's a dye factory for Levi's, and they put out a significant amount of arsenic. It turns out, um, and they would be they would be one of the people, one of the ones that people point to. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that the company that, that um, really upsets the people in El Salto and the community is actually Hershey's. Um,
um, because it's just their chocolate strong odor. Mm -hmm. I know. Who would have thought? Um, Happy food. Really, right. they, it, the, the oils that they dispose actually kills off a lot of, um, of fish and other other um, creatures. And you know, they, it was, I was surprised. Um, there are some other companies, but I'm very hesitant to mention them until I have done my entire research. And what do they? Good job. What do they have to say in, I assume that you made efforts, <coughs> right? What do they, do, do we have any idea what they have to say individually, company-wise, in their own defense? Well, one, I mean, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in this regard, um, but they do say that they, they follow basic regulation, and they say that they use their treatment plan. Um, IBM would say that. Um, so would Foxconn. Uh, that's on the same campus as IBM. Um, they, they would just say that they follow the, nor the norms, um, and they don't have to say too much more because, again, my investigation, I find that it's there's very little regulation even in the documents they have sent to the government. Right. So um, there's very little oversight. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. My question is also for Jason and Steve. I'm wondering about the title. How you happened upon this uh, title? It's really evocative. The idea of a river either having voice or, in this case, being silent. What, what, what are you trying to evoke? It's really vivid. I'm wondering how you happened upon that. What do you mean by it? Well, uh, I, we, we played with this. We came up with the title um, kind of quite at the, at the last minute. Um, <laughs> we, were, we were driving back up from the U.S.-Mexico border, and we're kind of in the car from San Diego up here for six or seven hours, and we figured if this, if it ever was going to get done, this was the moment to do it, and this was maybe three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, we struggled with it for a long time, and, and I think what we, what we really came to was this notion that, that a river can have a voice, um, and that we really were interested with this idea, actually, that, that Professor Saragossa tipped us off to, which was this, this notion that you could kill a river which wasn't something that I had ever, in, in my upbringing or anything, had ever really thought about. They, the notion that a river could die. And yet, physically, I mean, you can see it. It's still there. It's still, it still makes a noise, but there is a, a silence that is kind of carried by it um, because of the, the state that it, it currently exists in. And so we kind of settled on this, on this notion that um, you know, the, the juxtaposition of that a river should have life, it should, it, ha it should have noise, it should have a presence, it should have voice, and yet this river doesn't. It's been, it's a complete externality of, of, what, of what has happened to it. So, um, yeah, I think that, that kind of juxtaposition really, really, we, we felt it as well. So that's kind of how we landed on it. Yeah, sure, Carly, and then, yeah. I just wanted to add one thing to it, because I think the film really, brilliantly and very movingly addresses these issues. Uh, I want to relate one incident uh, that I've never forgotten during the NAFTA debate. I've been in literally hundreds of the Maquiladoras, uh, the, these border assembly plants. They are often very different than the stereotype many people have. Mexico, for example, is I think today the world's largest producer of flat screen TVs. You might go into a brand new flat screen TV assembly plant. It is pristine. It is a very state of the art, very advanced looking building. You might as well be in Silicon Valley uh, just from the outside, in part because you can't assemble electronics any other way. So people walk through and write glowing reports without much of a knowledge of the industrial process that's going on. For example, what chemicals are being used. Very often you will see the hazard warnings only in English. What's happening to the waste? And then often in sight of these very advanced industrial parks, you will go, or you can go to the home of maquiladora workers, that is assembly workers, working in some of the most advanced factories in the world, and their homes are literally built out of the packing crate material of the raw materials that are being shipped into these plants. And the rivers that run through these communities have these highly toxic chemicals that are being poured into them. In some cases, the company may have state-of-the-art equipment and then there are financial pressures 
or a machine breaks down and you want to shut down the production while you fix the machine, that doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. And then maybe the machine doesn't get fixed for a week. Here's the story I briefly want to tell. Near the end of the NAFTA debate, I was invited to go with seven women who are members of the US Congress on an official congressional trip to Reynosa. Uh, we saw these plants, you know, state-of-the-art TV plants, and then we went to meet with people in their homes who worked into them. And it was a community exactly the way I'm describing, built literally out of packing crates. And we went into the homes of workers in the plants we had been in. Uh, and it was a very, very moving experience. Uh, and at the end of each visit, uh, everyone hugged. Because it was an official congressional trip, there was a medical doctor uh, assigned to the trip who was an a Air Force officer. And at the end of the second house we were in, he pulled us all aside. And he was obviously very nervous about saying this. He said, you know, it's not for me to interfere in the trip. But I have to say, uh, this is an area that's in a floodplain. All of this was completely flooded several weeks ago. Cholera is prevalent in this community. You can't touch the people. And at that moment, there was this moment of, we we're talking about advanced at the time 20th century factories and a medieval disease among the most highly productive factories in the world and people living like this with these kinds of illnesses, is this a trade agreement that effectively addressed that? And that, I think, is the key question. We had a, a question here first, and then there's so. um, I'm, I'm glad that Professor Gurney returned to this question of who's the worst violator, because I think it has to be answered. Um, does have to be answered. Can you speak up just a little bit so they yeah, can The question of who is the worst, who, who's most responsible, who's worst, I would think it has to be answered in order to get to the other side of that, which is how do we deal with this? Um, and as we become more familiar about environmental damage here mm -hmm. in the US, um, in California as well as in West Virginia, as we watch rivers being destroyed where there may be a difference of degree, but not of kind. It seems to me there is a consistent um, pattern. I'm not sure, uh, Harley, that we can deal with NAFTA if we can't deal with the question here of having regulation and enforcing that regulation um, in ways that are meaningful. Well, I want to segue from your observation to something that Harley said earlier on. You spoke uh, in the beginning of companies facing what you referred to as pressures and inducements to do the wrong thing. Right. Be a little more specific about what those pressures and inducements are and whether they are in any particular manner worse on the Mexican side of the border than here. Uh, I think they are absolutely worse. and. When I say it, I'm not saying who the worst violator is, these chemicals don't exist in nature. They didn't simply show up in the river. Somebody is pouring them in large quantities into these rivers, into, into many other sites. There's no question that these firms are directly culpable. Uh, but it isn't simply evil people cutting corners. In some cases, it's just that. It is the normal pressures that any firm faces that can lead to horrific damage. It'd be a little bit like with GM, this ignition uh, switch. That is a horrible act. At least 13 people died, perhaps many more. So it's not a question of that this just happened. It reflected, in this case, a culture and a set of practices. So how do you ensure that, though, that that culture and set of practices is brought under control? It is never one thing you do. It's not a one-shot deal. It is a consistent regulation, enforcement, and addressing of these issues. Yes. This is a really powerful and compelling piece of storytelling. 
that must not just wander. And I really appreciate this really uh, important conversation right now we're all having. Um, and I'd like to bring attention to the, you know, everything you're referring to mm -hmm. seems to me to be part of a much larger kind of systemic question. And I was listening uh, to Democracy Now! yesterday about HSBC admitting to be laundering $800 million for, for you know, drug, um, for drug uh, mafioso firms, basically, and uh, drug companies um, in, uh, in Mexico and Colombia. Meanwhile, people are being put in jail, millions of people are being put in jail for having a joint in their pocket. And no one can be found to go to jail or serve any time at HSBC. So we're looking at a larger sort of economic and political system and paradigm. How does this story fit into that? And how the filmmakers and professors and people here in this room want to use this story as an example to have that larger conversation and to act, talk about real change that needs to happen. Well, uh, the real question is, do you want to have the larger conversation or do you want to focus on these problems? Because an often, oftentimes, the larger conversation just causes everybody to fall into a morass of, to use a technical term, right? <laughs> and silence ensues because people's worldviews are so very different. So. I mean, part of, it, this is an unfair question to throw at the filmmakers, but I want to ask you, you were there much more than any of us, although you gave us such a vivid image of it. Based on what you learned, if you were emperors, how would you fix this place? Just for starters. <laughs> Not the economic systems of the world, this place. That is a very unfair question. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I acknowledged as such. And, and, and just a brief correction, I'm, I'm certain that uh, Professor Shankin was probably there many, many more times than I was, but certainly the time that I, that we spent there, um, I, I, again, I don't know. I think that they don't know. I think that, that our characters really are at a loss of knowing how to, because it's so complex. Um, I think one of the things that maybe summed it up in the film was when Sophia said, we don't, we're not fighting the industry, we're fight, we want them to treat their waste. And that, I mean, again, I, I, Pretty specific. I can't, right. I, I can't answer the question. Right. I, I, I don't know um, if Professor Shaken would have something to elaborate on. Uh, but other than that, it was really difficult because we felt really sort of immersed in, in just this horror, essentially. And it was hard to see beyond other right. than that um, all of those companies disappeared and it reverted to what what was you know back in the 1940s? Because what I seem to hear you saying, Harley, is not the sort of blanket argument that one sometimes gets in reading anti-NAFTA mm -hmm. argument, which is all of this industry was just a pestilence by its very nature upon right. the land. You're not saying that. No. You're saying that it did in fact bring jobs. It did in fact bring some people, perhaps not enough, perhaps mm -hmm. the not not the right class, material gain but that it was put in badly and it needs to treat its waste, as, as she said, right? Right. So it's not quite that broad an indictment of NAFTA's effect on this particular community insofar as it brought industry and jobs in? Well, that's something that I've actually learned from many hundreds of people I've spoken with working in these factories. Mm -hmm. Uh, I truly have never met a person in these factories that wants to see them shut down. Interesting. Uh, that's their livelihood. That's mm -hmm. what the communities are based on. They want to see them act in a more responsible way. Right. And they understand it isn't simply good feeling. It is an issue of power. And the flip side of that is what happens on the labor side of it, mm -hmm. where you have wages so compressed uh, the irony is you are throttling the very purchasing power right. that were it to exist would expand trade. Uh, and I think in both cases, it's not the issue of not wanting the technology or the industry. It's an issue of not wanting to be its victims. Got it. Yes. So thank you for the answer. And I would like to echo what the gentleman asked a little bit ago about where to assign the blame. And of course, in Mexico, if you go to a place and you take advantage of the culture, and in Mexico there's culture, there's this saying that says, <coughs> pardon my, my words, but the jodes or the ching. <laughs> you're screwed or you're screwed. And there, either, you don't, or either you're unemployed 
or your kids get cancer. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you go to a place and take advantage of the culture, then it's, you are doing that. Of course, Mexicans are to blame because of the lack of regulation. But you are not changing anything. You're just taking advantage of it. So I would assign the blame, assign the blame on the US and, and, and the people who signed that pact. Um, so in terms of how to solve this, I feel that this is a great first step. Because I'm from Mexico City myself, and I had never, I was never aware of this. Um, so thank you for the filmmakers. So as a as a Mexican national or someone who grew up in Mexico, your feeling is very much it's, it should have been the U.S.'s responsibility, since these companies were American companies to start with, am I understanding you right, to well, enforce these kinds of, to enforce the kinds of laws that they would have argued for in the United States, is that fair? So I say that this is the U.S. fault, but Mexico's poverty is also their problem. Right. You know, this is at the root of people not having better jobs right. that the Mexican government should be providing. Right. Um, but I'm saying that the U.S. is taking advantage of that fact. It's let's take just it. let's take just two more questions, and then we'll let people go home for for supper. Yes, sir. Well, um, just to kind of perceive and the rest of the people here, I, I, I keep hearing the, the the stories about the bigger structures, and one of the things that's really striking to me is that the community there doesn't see any of this in this generation or in their lifetime. Um, and I see that there's a lot of Well, let me, yeah. let, me, let me let the filmmakers try to address that, and then, and then maybe Harley as well. <laughs> well, I think just, uh, and as Steve mentioned, my, my comprehension of Spanish is, is partial at best, and so I have kind of a, a sense of what was happening down there, but I think what, what you're seeing is this, is this community that's being silenced, and it's being silenced in a way that, you know, we actually, had a lot of debate about this kind of back in the United States and trying to like figure out how do you communicate to Americans that these death threats are real and that these death threats are coming and they, they do not, you know, our, our, this family does not know who is, at, who is behind these death threats, but they're very, very real. And, you know, I think it's something that we had a little, you know, feels a little bit lost in translation in the sense that like that, that kind of, that boogeyman is there without, you know, without us having an answer for Without us knowing, you know, that there are, you know, clearly there's somebody who is on the, I mean, our main characters had two trees in the front of their home that they needed to chop down because there was, there was actually a, 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 a structure built in the tree that they found somebody had been living in. Somebody was living in that structure, uh, you know, actually spying on them, you know, for a long period of time. They don't know who. They don't know where that order is coming from. There's, there's no, way, you know, there's no access for them to trace it back. And so we struggled with this a lot. And I think that that's what, you know, that's the, the kind of the, the shift that you're talking about in terms of, of, the, of uh, the guard being passed along. I think that the next generation is trying to figure out how to operate, you know, in a way that is meaningful and is impactful. And we found that in Sophie, someone who is trying 
with everything she has. You know, she, she all but says she is willing to put her life down for this community and for this river. And it was something that I think we, you know, despite the weight of the film, we found a lot of hope in. That, that, that it's, it's there, the seed is there. And how we empower that as filmmakers, I think is an ongoing conversation that, that we're trying to have. It was interesting to me that you chose to do the entire film in Spanish. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alex and a couple of people certainly could have spoken in, in English had they wished to. Is this because you want to distribute it to a Latin American audience or just for general consistency all the way through? I, I think the, I think films are like this, you know, I think it's really amazing to be able to, to, to go there and to witness this and to mm -hmm. see it and to come back and to share it with this community that has a certain amount of empowerment and mm -hmm. that can, that we, that we feel that, you know, for me, I think that's a, that's an incredible power as a storyteller to go and to bring something back and to share. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for, that power is is equal to the idea of of showing it there. This film, you know, we can we can debate these issues here, right. and I think we can have a very very you know broad uh, approach about how to solve these kind of from the top down. But this film needs to be shown there. It needs to be shown in Guadalajara. It needs to be shown in El Salto. It needs to be shown in El Depe, and people need to see it there. Where where you know I like Steve and I in the center in the back back of the room. Like, si really señor. Stand up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions uh, before we before Yes. Um, I just had a comment. It, just, it felt kind of like you're giving a, the corporations a pass. I mean, it's not that a corporation asks to be regulated. It's because we as the people want to be protected and we ask for the regulation. And so kind of saying like, who's the worst company feels like, you know, oh, we're we're giving them a pass and we're just going to pick out the worst one. When it's really up to the leaders of those companies and their integrity uh, and doing the right thing and having regard for the people that work for them. And, and we, I mean, we know that they go there just to, not to be um, regulated. But I did have a question for the filmmakers because one of the things that has been covered this last week on Democracy Now! is what is happening to our environmentalists and them losing their life around the world when they when they stand up. And so how do you talk a little bit about feeling the danger for this, you know, for well, the let's, people? Well, let's turn that into, into a question for the future. Uh, have you been back in touch with, it's Sophia, right? Mm -hmm. um, have you been back in touch with her? How are things? Um, they're, they're doing quite well, um, relatively speaking. Um, they, I don't know, I, I when I asked, they hadn't been threatened since they came back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you they haven't been threatened at all. Mm -hmm. But they're back and they're fighting and they're far more careful than they were before. They're far less innocent and they're they're far more careful. Um, but yeah, it's 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 dramatic. I mean, you go there and you know the, what we didn't mention in the film is that um, Graciela, Sofia's mother, actually they they do think she has cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and she wouldn't talk to us about that. Interesting. And we certainly didn't push it. Right. Um, but, you know, death has possibly come closer to them than they expect. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I am curious. I would love to hear your response, Harley, Harley to the, um, the question that was presented earlier to us. So how do you see the grassroots movement happening in Mexico? And, and how do you think that people um, could best uh, approach this from places like El Salvador? Oh, I think the grassroots movement is absolutely essential. It won't, the change won't come from enlightenment on a certain day. It's gonna come from real pressure and political engagement. It's very difficult, as you well know, in Mexico, these people are remarkably courageous, but there have been important changes in Mexico since NAFTA was passed. There's a ways to go, but, but the essential ability of people to engage their own lives and to build linkages that span borders, I think is going to be absolutely essential. This is one of the extraordinary things we found, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, the, uh, the Center for Latin American Studies, we took the entire elected leadership of the machinist union to Mexico, into these border communities, 
to meet with people, to talk with environmental activists. This is 1,100 people over a three-year period. Uh, and when they went, in, uh, you know, usually 40 or 100 a trip, people going down were, the, the machinist leaders were, tended to be a bit critical, you know, these Mexicans are stealing our jobs. You can't talk about somebody stealing your job when you're in their home, when you meet them, when they're a presence. Uh, and some of those relationships are still continuing. On the environment, those possibilities are there. There are some extraordinary NGOs, still weak, but absolutely essential. The, what's, I think, so powerful about the film is the cost of not addressing it. Kids with these skin diseases or cancer or dying because you happen to slip into a river, that ought to be wildly unacceptable. Uh, and corporations are absolutely seizing the dimension of this that simply says the costs are lower and you don't have unnecessary governmental interference. It's not unnecessary governmental interference. It is vital to have people benefit from this production. Well, that's a pretty ringing note to end on. Thank you, Harley, and thank both of you very much for your work on this.